very pleased uh, to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Jenny Johnson. Jenny is a partner at uh, Terremoto, a landscape design firm based in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Terremoto approaches landscape and garden making with an experimental and sound approach, with projects spanning residential, institutional, commercial, private and public. Terremoto is also engaged with the community work through a test plot, an ongoing collaborative experiment in shared land stewardship. Through the test plot, as well as Terremoto's land and labor internal working group, they seek to strengthen the ethics of land care in the landscape industry and in our culture more broadly. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. We are very excited to hear from you and about the process. Calgary. Um, and it's been fun learning a little bit more about the school and the town and kind of the, the landscape issues that face this community. Francisco invited me um, just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> it was kind of last minute, but I said yes. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Jenny. I'm originally from Virginia. I was trained at the University of Virginia and learned all those plants. Um, trained in landscape architecture and urban planning. Um, and then I moved to California and had to learn all the plants, which is interesting. Um, and I've been there for 10 years, and I've been with Terramoto for about uh, seven years. Um, Terramoto is a landscape architecture design studio with offices in Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, as Enrique said. And we work mostly in California, but not exclusively in California. We have some um, projects in other states. Um, Terramoto creates thoughtful, site-specific landscapes that respond to client needs while simultaneously engaging in historical and contemporary landscape construction methods, materials, and formal conventions. Our design approach is post-internet, critically regionalist, and respectfully inflammatory. So get ready to be inflamed. Um, we are a practice that, they, um, that believes in constant evolution. We are not experts or academics but practicing designers operating with a curious beginner's mindset. Um, I also need to start by recognizing the indigenous people of the lands in which we work. Um, the Tongva, the Kitsch, the Ferdinandia Tataviam, the Chumash, the Ahachiman, the Serrano, Como, Wapo, Coast Miwok, and Ohlone people as the original inhabitants and stewards of the land on which we now live and work in California. With this land acknowledgement, um, we seek to speak the truth of the injustices inflicted on these tribes by the state. And we also seek reconciliation through ongoing support for and collaboration with the tribes. We know that land acknowledgements on their own are not enough, but we still feel it's important to speak this truth, especially when our lens is one of land care and stewardship. This is us, this is our team. We're about 25 people spread between the two offices. Um, we work mostly in the context of the massive, complex urban regions of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, yes, we are designers. We're landscape architects. Um, most of us went to school for landscape architecture. But we are gardeners first. We often frame our design work through the lens of gardening. Tending, tidying, cultivating, pruning, and composting. Um, and in fact, I'm going to throw Francisco under the bus here because he's not here. So I get to do that. Um, I wanted to put the word garden in the, the title of this lecture. Um, and I got a little pushback. Um, was, was asked to use different words. And uh, I think that's a sign that people are afraid of the word gardens. Gardens often are associated with kind of the elite or hobbies. And something that Terramoto really stands for is bringing gardening back into landscape architecture. I don't, how many of you are landscape architecture students? Um, you've probably had the following conversation. You go home for the holidays. What do you do? Um, I'm studying landscape architecture. Oh, landscaping. Can you do my yard? <sighs> no. <laughs> That's not what I do. Right? There's this, like, um, chip on our shoulder a little bit. 
about when we're Nancy architects. And I did the same thing when I was in school. Um, and now in retrospect, I think that's problematic. I think the fact that we devalue the landscaper, why do we think we're different? We're all doing the same work. We're stewarding the land and caring for it and shaping it. Um, so I think that um, fear of the word landscaper and the fear of the word gardening, I think is, is a problem. So we want to celebrate the idea of gardens. So yes, my lecture is about design and stewardship, but really it's about gardens. <laughs> Sorry, Francisco, I love you. Um, even though I just met you. Um, Oh, that was my land acknowledgement slide, I apologize. Um, I'll speak just real quick. I, I did say that land acknowledgements are not enough and we fully acknowledge that. We're sort of aware of the complexities of that, um, but we do our best to support the, the local tribes that are in our communities by collaborating with them, by donating to them as much as they can, asking them as, um, as much as possible what they need. So we are trying to move towards that reconciliation aspect. Um, yeah, so this is, this is some beautiful photos of our work. We do think of the world as a garden. Um, and every landscape, whether it's private or public, rural or urban, can be cultivated as a garden. We are inspired by Julian Raxworthy, who wrote the book Overgrown, and if you don't know it, you should check it out. Um, he's an Australian thinker and gardener, landscape architect. Um, and Julian calls for a return to gardening within landscape architecture. Um, he, the book is really beautifully written about some of his experience on gardens and how the understanding of pruning and how the architecture of plants themselves influences the architecture of the space, the bigger spaces that they're set within is really important. Um, and so Terramoto definitely positions ourselves within that movement of kind of bringing gardening back architecture. These images of our work that I'm showing you now and I'm going to keep showing you are quite nice. Um, we have some nice photographers on our staff and a, a really great photographer that we work with. Um, but I want to also acknowledge the limits of photography in telling the full story of the garden. Photos represent static moments in time and perpetuate the primacy of the visual in our culture. But their power is also fascinating to us. The image truly does reign in our society. Um, so we're fascinated by these types of complexities. We seek to mine these contradictions for lessons on how to burden, how to shape and interact with our planet. We are not defined by a singular style. We're very interested in the clash of styles that you see in California. Calgary is pretty different, right? There's like a limited plant palette that will grow here. You probably see some different cultivars from other regions, but in California, you can grow a lot of things from all over the world. And because of the clash of cultures that's there as well, um, the immigrant populations that have been changing over the last centuries and decades, um, there is a beautiful cacophony of cultures and plants there. And we love, we love that. We love to like mash plants up together, like in the lower left image. There's native plants there, there's plants from Mexico and Central America, um, there's plants from South Africa and um, Asia, and we love to um, bring all these plants together to make kind of a beautiful chaos. Um, we, um, as I said earlier, we're also critically regionalist, so we don't have like a set style. We actually like to explore lots of different styles, but in each of those stylistic explorations, we work through the lens of regionalism. So what's climatically appropriate, um, what's appropriate to the culture of the site, the culture of the landowner, of the building, response to the architectural style of the building. So there's so many layers with which to work when you're working in California that um, makes garden making quite fun. I'm gonna talk about process a little bit. Process is key for us. Um, Terramoto loves lots of time on site, um, nearby the site, on the way to the site, lost down a rabbit hole looking for fossils. Um, the process of engaging with the site is a really emotional process for us. It's, it's a real emotional force. Um, and when you go to our website, you'll see, it. you'll see this on our website. Our website looks different from other firms. We don't have the finished, polished photos. We have those, but we also have photos of us and other people that we're collaborating with on site and um, photos of the workers, which I'll speak to more. Um, 
We absolutely adore the process of working with others. We seek diverse dialogue and we seek out disagreements. We think that gardens always benefit from these nonlinear conversations and multiple voices. Um, and of course, like all designers, we enjoy the research, the site assessment, the metaphors, the conceptual exploration, all of those processes within the process, within the process. And that's what we find so fascinating about working with landscapes and gardens. Um, this is a bit of a one-off, but this was, these were some of our process diagrams from working on Sea Ranch. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Sea Ranch, but it's a Lawrence Halpern designed landscape in Northern California, um, truly a, a housing development that was pretty progressive for the time in that it was very strict in the architectural style, and Lawrence Halpern um, designed the landscape to be as natural and regionally appropriate as possible, and the placement of the houses was working with the winds and the views, and the houses are sort of designed to um, blend into this beautiful, powerful landscape. And the conceptual work that Lawrence Halpern did um, at the time, several decades ago, was really interesting and innovative, and we feel very fortunate to have worked on that and to kind of study some of the things that he did there. Um, I want to acknowledge Eric and Hannah from our office, who did these conceptual drawings um, at the very start of a project. So they're not plans, they're not perspectives, they're sort of ideograms, they're kind of in between, and they're beautiful and time consuming. Um, but we love doing them. And although the final product of the garden plan might not look like this, we see a lot of value in, in doing drawings like this early on. More drawings by Danny and Lauren from our office. More fun in just dreaming about gardens and what they might be and the possibilities they might bring. Um, we like to dream before we do the garden. We like to dream during, and then we like to visit the garden after and dream on that as well. Um, our our construction drawings are um, never sacred, so um, we often treat them as diagrams. We, of course, do. We like to work um, by hand a lot. Um, we do have some people on staff that do really beautiful digital renderings. I am not one of those people, so I'm not showing you those. Um, I also have a little bit of a, of a vendetta against digital renderings um, myself personally. That's not a Terra Moto view. That's a Jenny Jones view. Um, so I'm not showing you any renderings <laughs> for that reason. Um, we do our hand drawings, we do the conceptual drawings, we jump to construction drawings. However, our construction drawings, like I said, are not sacred. We treat them more as diagrams or the beginning of the dialogue. That step of bringing the drawing to the site and sorting things out with the client and the contractor on site is um, just so much fun and really important. And I think that the final product of the garden um, is always better when it's a, a dialogue. Um, we're not design build, but we do often behave that way. We sort of act like we are, in that we have some contractors that we work with a lot um, over and over, and we have a very strong relationship with them, and they get us and we get them, and we can have these kinds of dialogues on site where that allow for improvisation. We like to figure things out um, on site, over time, in deep collaboration with the clients and the contractors. And we find a lot of beauty in the improvisation that occurs when we work this way. We also find a lot of beauty in these moments. Um, and David from our office, who's one of the founding partners, um, was really the person to pioneer this like obsessive documentation of the process. But I think it really resonates with people. And I think that's because it's the, um, the shielding of the process from the conversations about our landscapes is it's just, it's a problem. Um, why not celebrate all of the beauty inherent in the process? Um, there's beauty also in the power and the skill of the contractors and the gardeners we work with. Um, the process of softly um, editing an old, an old garden um, or powerfully bringing in machinery and moving around big chunks of recycled logs or big boulders. Um, there's beauty in the interim and in the garden that goes nowhere. The one on the left was a, um, is actually my neighbor's garden in Los Angeles and he wanted to collaborate with us and we came out and talked with him about what we might do to edit his existing garden, which is already fantastic. And we talked with him and we made a little plan and then a couple months later he came to me and he said, just scratch the whole thing. I'm gonna just do it myself. 
And it was through the conversations that inspired him to actually take it on himself. And we said, great, have fun. <laughs> See you later. Um, I get to help him on the weekends a little bit. Um, this is, these are just some fun photos of um, drawing with the mower. So this is a project we have in Texas, one of our out-of-state projects, where we had a general idea of where we were placing the pads, but really it was me and the guys out there with the mower walking it and mowing it and feeling it out together. Um, laying things out in real time. The other beautiful part of the process to us is the ongoing care which I know is a big topic in our field right now, the field of landscape architecture, is the problem of the lack of budget for maintenance and the problem of the lack of designing for maintenance. Um, and so the beauty in the ongoing care is really powerful for us. We like to stay involved in the stewardship of the sites that we work on. We develop very close relationship with the gardeners over time. Not on every site, right? There's some clients who say, okay, goodbye, see you, and we, we don't really see them again. But for a lot of our clients, they ask us to come back and edit and revise. And so there's ongoing design that happens as well. Not only ongoing consultation with the gardener on how to maintain the landscape, but um, revisions for things that are not working or disease, you know, new diseases pop up and we have to change things. Um, so we love that, that ongoing care, and it's really an important part of our process. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Pretty good. Um, I would say another key um, factor, in addition to the process, that identifies Terrebonne's work and kind of um, set, lets us stand out from other firms is our embracing simple details and materials. That was actually one of the first things that drew me to Terremoto. Um, was how simple the designs were. Um, and it was at a time in landscape architecture, I don't know if it's still this way, actually, in school. I'd be curious to talk to you and find out when very complicated designs were very popular. Kind of the more detailed it was, and the more parametric it was, and the more it was something you've never seen before, and it's going to blow your mind. Um, that those were things that everybody was seeking. And those are the projects that win awards and they get attention. And I started to feel like I um, was a little lost in the profession. Uh, you know, I came to the profession wanting to be an environmentalist. I think most of us do. And I was feeling like what we were doing as a profession was quite wasteful and um, just wrong, in the wrong direction. Why are we trying to outcompete each other with these designs that no one's ever seen before because it looks good on a computer rendering or it looks good on a, in an award book. And when I first saw Terremoto's work, um, and to be fair, I, I want to give credit to David and Alan as the, the founders of Terremoto. When they first started the office, they immediately split it up into San Francisco and Los Angeles, which was another very unconventional move, was to immediately start in two cities. Um, and the two of them both have an incredible eye for the symbol and an incredible ethic for keeping things efficient and cost effective. And I was very drawn to that when I first um, learned about their work. Um, we love fences. I don't know if you've gathered that from our website, but we love playing with fence shapes and um, different vernacular styles. We love a simple fence. We, we like simple designs, but we also like unique designs. So even though we're doing things that are unique, we like to think of them as like simple and not fussy. And um, like in this fence down here, we're using the entire piece of the split rail cedar. There's nothing being trimmed or anything. We simply laid it down in between pieces of metal. Um, so trying to keep things cost effective and efficient in the means of construction. Uh, boulders as seats is a big theme you see in our work, which actually, funnily enough, I've, I've explored some Calgary parks today, and that's like the norm for here, right? That's the vernacular. But down in California, um, it's not. It's, it's novel <laughs> within landscape architecture to be proposing just boulders as seats. So this, none of this is new for you all, but um, for us Americans, it, it's strange and new territory. I don't know why. We all forgot about boulders, apparently. <laughs> Um, but we really love the power of stone to shape space um, and experience. Um, there's something about, we call these our power circles. Um, just putting stones in a circle in a project is like a very typical terremoto move. Um, the honesty of materials and the honesty of how the materials got there and how they get moved around. This is a project down at the waterfront in the Bay Area. 
and um, with the recognition of um, the threat of sea level rise, this project was designed to, for everything to be kind of movable. So the entire landscape can be moved around. So the plants are in their planters, the rocks are on pallets, um, the heavy timbers can be easily picked up and moved around um, kind of in an improvisational way over time. Um, we also um, are really into humility and efficiency. And I like to say cheap things. Um, David sometimes tells me, don't say that. But it's true. We like cheap materials. We like to go to Home Depot and find out, see what's on the shelves, um, or the local, um, the local landscape supply shops and see what's there. Rather than sourcing things from the internet or from catalogs or from far, far away, we like to see what's readily available and what's affordable for people um, and to come up with um, interesting ways to use them. So this bench is made out of um, kind of an informal, tiny, small footing that you can buy off the shelf for building small structures. And we turned it into the base of, of this bench. And then those are pavers that um, actually, I think our client came up with that, just needing a quick um, solution for that step being too large. Um, I think that might have been the architect's fault. I don't, I don't remember. Um, and I think they came up with that solution, which I think is quite elegant. Um, and we're interested in bringing these kind of simple and humble materials into the public realm, right? I think to what I was saying a minute ago about public landscape work becoming very fussy and very high gloss, um, and everything's custom, and everything's on an angle or on a curve, and there's bits being cut off and wasted and thrown away, and who knows where those little bits of wood are going. This is a project um, that we, this photo is from like a couple days ago. We're, we're completing it um, this week in Denver. And this is, um, we have a couple public projects, but uh, this is one of our more recent, and we're very excited. We hope we keep getting more public work. Terramoto started out in the, in the residential world, like most small firms do, which allowed us to have a lot of time to hone our skills and play with materials and experiment. And now um, we're excited to bring some of that back into the public realm. Um, we've got just like big chunky logs, big boulders, um, water bowls for birds and bees. Um, and then also the reuse of materials is another big thing that we're into. I will speak a little more on that later. Um, kind of mining the ruins of the urban landscape. Los Angeles and San Francisco provide a lot of raw material. We often are asked by a client to come and redo the landscape and we try as much as possible to reuse what we can. So these black cobbles, um, clients didn't like them in the way that they were arranged in a solid field, but when we did this, the client was fine with it. So we were able to re reuse them and kind of unite them with a different, a new flagstone. Um, so just limiting the amount of trash that's leaving the site. Uh, this is the same project, but a different part of the site where um, they, Tragically, we're losing a lot of the big specimen oaks on site due to some mismanagement of the landscape in years past. And when we got to the site, a lot of these oaks had already fallen or were in the process of falling. And rather than hauling the wood off site, we're bringing a chipper on site and spending fossil fuels to process the wood. Um, we cut the wood and use it as a retaining wall. Um, and literally, the tree fell right there. So we just used it right there. <laughs> we didn't even move it to a different part of the site. Um, so so yeah, just kind of that like simplicity um, and using what, what's available to you. I think it's something we're quite interested in. This is another image of material reuse, but also I'm gonna start moving into our um, favorite topic, which is that of planting and botanical expression. So this is a project in El Sereno, a working class neighborhood outside of Los Angeles, or in Los Angeles on the east side. And these pavers, the square ones, were all left over from an installation that we had done at a museum where we needed these pavers for, for this art piece that we did. And then when the show was over, we stored them at our office for several months. And then I found this client who wanted to save some money and, and we reused the pavers. And then the broken pieces of concrete kind of scattered around were from um, some demolition that we had done on their site. So just trying to keep things, you know, keep the circles local. Um, but now I'm gonna talk about um, planting. Terramoto's approach to planting. You can probably tell from the images you've seen so far, we're very into exuberant, wild, messy, entangled planting schemes. Um, and part of that is just a celebration of the culture, the botanical and horticultural culture that we see in Los Angeles that um, is really a representation of the cultural diversity of the people that are all there. Um, 
but also the habitat that's created by dense plantings. We've been doing something at Terremoto, which is planting very densely for, for several years now, and we've gotten some criticism from people who say, oh, you're gonna have to, that's too dense, you're gonna have to come in and remove some of those plants, or that's gonna be a maintenance nightmare. And our philosophy is let the plants sort it out, right? Like, you plant two plants right next to each other, one's gonna win, and that's fine. The other one might die out, but um, what we've learned since then is that our kind of intuitive planting style that we fell into um, is actually being scientifically tested. I don't know if you all have heard of the Miyawaki reforestation method. Has anybody heard of this? There's a professor in Japan, um, Miyawaki, who is testing this concept of microforests, which is, um, he's testing it as like a low input method for reforestation in urban areas. And the, the idea of a microforest is to plant very densely. Um, and you plant a mix of trees and herbaceous ground, plant, uh, ground layer plants and then some shrubs. And um, it's the same philosophy where not all the plants are gonna make it, but that, and that's okay. But in the process of growing, when they're first starting to grow, the competition that they um, experience right up against each other actually forces them to grow faster and you can get more mature forests um, much faster than you were if you were planting the trees 20 feet on center with just mulch and no grappling. So it's the it's like a competitiveness between the plants, but also a, they're all supporting each other as well. And that dense entanglement of plant life also encourages biodiversity, which encourages soil health, so as you get this kind of positive feedback loop. So we were really happy to learn about this method recently because we felt kind of vindicated in our, in our planting style. Um, Let's see, I talked about the vernacular of LA hillsides and global culture. We, um, we do like to plant a lot of natives. Um, I was talking with one of you earlier um, before the lecture about um, the difference between Calgary and California. Um, one of the big differences I see in the landscape, and somebody tell me if I'm wrong after the lecture. But in California, we have a huge problem with invasive plants and with the collapse of ecosystems. California has a very interesting biodiversity. Um, the native plant life there is um, extremely diverse. You get these pockets of very um, different plant ecosystems based on the diverse geology and the diverse climate that's created by fog and um, different solar aspects and all the different little micro regions of California make for a very diverse um, set of plants. Um, and that's all being threatened by um, invasives and development and drought and mismanagement. I don't know if I see that so much here in Calgary. From what I've heard, you, Calgary doesn't have a big problem with invasive plants, and that's probably due to the climate. Head shakes, anybody have any? Maybe, does anyone know? <laughs> do you have invasive plants? <laughs> you do. Is it like a rampant problem? Like every, every spot that we've uh, stopped cultivating here is taken over by Hungarian growing Canada thistle, which is not from Canada. It's okay. From Europe as well. Okay. So that's kind of our invasive community that is uh, in Huh. Okay, so my perception that's stands corrected. Uh, if, you, if you go down to some of our alleyways, okay. you'll, you'll see that community okay. or, or a naturalized area in the park. Okay. Okay. So, Interesting. You can hear that it's all massive. Hmm. Some trees on the river and stuff like that. Right. So, but uh, but uh, yeah, that original grassland is extremely diverse here. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I mean, I went out to Fish Creek today, um, which was yeah. gorgeous. I know that's not maybe like an original old, so old growth Creek. situation, but it still was interesting. Yeah. And the entire mm -hmm. valley was diverse grassland. Right. Now it's almost like 95% the very oh. Little pockets of the, the, the European crystal. And that's because that was former like rangeland, right? Yeah. Fascinating. I want to know everything about all of that. Um, I might have to ping you after this. Um, but for the sake of time, let me keep going with these slides. Um, so we like to plant mostly natives, um, but we're not strict about it. We, when we're not planting natives, like this agave americana at the bottom, we try to pick things that are not like overly aggressive. Um, we, we love Emma Maris's book, The Rambunctious Garden. Have you all heard of this book? Um, she basically talks about um, the obsession with being strictly native is, 
is a little bit old fashioned and not very um, globally sophisticated of us. <laughs> the, the globe is like forever transformed. And um, there's another writer and um, academic named Peter Del Tredici, and I can't remember what school he's from, so I apologize. But he's got this concept of novel ecologies where rather than trying to restore a system back to some ecological past that we think was right or something at some point in time, um, we should be looking um, to create and steward ecosystems that function well and that do promote biodiversity, but, but maybe drop a little bit of that like fervor for strictly natives or that fervor for restoring, which um, I don't know, it's interesting to think about what are we restoring to, you know, what's that point? What point are we deciding is the point to restore to? It's a little bit, um, I don't know, egotistical of us or something. So, um, yeah, we plant mostly native, but we're not strict about it. We do love creating habitat um, and encouraging, you know, um, habitat for birds and all kinds of critters. There, there are a lot of wild critters in Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, maybe not as many as Calgary. But we do like to create habitat in our gardens. And of course, we like to plant drought, drought tolerant, because that's the other kind of big landscape issue facing, um, facing California. Is Calgary in droughts? Yes. OK. Is it a big issue? Or do you occasionally you have a drought? It's seven years here. We have 14 inches of rain a year. OK. And uh, it's normal for a month of rain. Our, are landscape people freaking out about the climate future here in terms of water scarcity, or not yet? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's it's everywhere. Um, rambunctious garden, not the ecologies. I talked about that. And again, not only um, you know I showed you the photo of kind of bringing. Um, simple details to public spaces. This is one of our projects um, in Los Angeles called Platform Park, one of our first public projects. Even though it's a semi-public, it's one of these pops, privately owned public spaces. Um, but we are interested in bringing like complex plantings and novel ecologies to public spaces, and plants that are unexpected that you might not see, in combinations that you may not have seen before, um, just to kind of bring the spirit of gardening to public spaces. Um, this is our native wild rye, Linus condensatus, Canyon Prince wild rye, which we use a lot and is a great habitat plant, but also looks really good in, in modern gardens. <laughs> um, we're definitely inspired by Japanese gardens and the use of negative space. We try to pay homage without um, copying, kind of um, thoughtlessly, too much. Uh, but when the architecture is appropriate, we employ, we, we look to Japanese gardens for inspiration. And again, you'll see some, like on the left-hand slide, there's some um, really great examples of California natives, the manzanita and the sacred datura, which is this psychedelic plant. I don't know if you guys know about this. Um, from um, California all the way down to you know, the Americas, Central America, um, really powerful symbolic plant. Um, so we've got like strict natives on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side, the existing context of this garden um, didn't really make sense for that. We, there probably are some natives in there, but it's not, it's not a strict palette. Um, the other thing that is really big in Los Angeles, and um, especially in Los Angeles right now, is gray water, and we do try to use that in most of our gardens. Do you guys do gray water here? Is that a thing? So I see a waiver in the back. Yes? My parents farm us. Great. I wonder if, it, if water scarcity becomes more of an issue here, if that is something that will be employed. I'm sure the cold climate is a factor, but um, gray water is basically the recycling of laundry water and um, bath water, and it's sent out into the landscape. And the project on the left was um, is a really wonderful apartment complex that was lovingly restored by some benevolent developers, benevolent um, developers, and they, we use gray water on the project. And so the palette is very tropical but um, these plants are all fed by gray water. And then the image on the right is a little orchard because fruit trees love gray water. They love the, the salts that are in the bath water. Um, and this was just after install. Um, kind of speaking to the, the question of style, we do love to play with styles, right? We've, we've got like some preppy, polished gardens that we've done when the setting is appropriate. Um, but really, we love the wild native gardens, and we love to juxtapose those, those wild habitat gardens up against um, incongruous architecture that would never have had a garden like this when that, when the house was built in the 1930s. 
Um, another big theme for us in our gardens is play, um, both in our private and our public gardens. Um, we see opportunities for play everywhere, and we see opportunities for children to play everywhere, for us to play and for children to play. Um, so we love the idea of just carving out tiny little spaces for children to be surrounded by complex ecologies and to have um, free play, unstructured, um, loose parts. We, we do pay attention to kind of the latest pedagogical thinking about um, childhood development and what's good for them. And I'm sure all of you are aware that nature play is kind of the de facto thing now. Everybody knows that. We shouldn't be putting in these plastic playgrounds. We should be throwing some logs on the ground and letting the kids move them around themselves. Um, and we're also interested in the architecture of play structures. We like to create our own using very simple materials, recycled materials. All of the wood on the, the right hand side, and in most of our projects where you see this chunky wood, this wood is reclaimed. So down in Los Angeles, we work with an organization called Angel City Lumber, and they take dead and drying, dead and dying trees that have to come down all over the city due to drought and disease. And they kiln dry the wood to get rid of any um, infestations that might be there. And, um, and then they mill it, and we use it in a lot of our projects. So most of these kind of chunky timbers that we use are all um, reclaimed urban wood. Um, we love building chicken coops, and we put those in our play gardens as much as possible, just recognizing the role that chickens play in the garden ecosystem and um, the idea of kinship with animals. We like to inject in our gardens as much as possible. Um, and then also stone and natural elements, um, just keeping things um, as natural as possible and trying to limit the use of, of um, man-made materials. Okay, test plot. I think that's why Francisco wanted me to come talk here. So thanks for sitting through the other stuff. Um, our interest in plant forwardness um, and in ecology and in process all kind of plug into the project of test plot. Test plot is a growing volunteer project that Terramoto has been involved in from the beginning, and it's it's now kind of growing beyond the bounds of Terramoto itself. Test Plot is an ongoing experiment in community land care. We are a coalition of designers, gardeners, teachers, ecologists, and community members that seek to restore and enhance the ecology of our public parks. I know I was sort of talking smack on the concept of ecological restoration a minute ago, but that's kind of what we're trying to do here. We still believe in ecological restoration. We just want to kind of be open-minded about it. Um, you know, the genesis of Test Plot, it all started in Elysian Park which is Los Angeles' oldest public park, uh, Dodger Stadium is in Elysian Park. And it's a great example of a common issue that we see in a, a lot of our public parks in the United States, which is um, no money for maintenance, deferred, deferred care, no care, broken uh, irrigation systems, um, formerly fashionable plants like eucalyptus that now are no longer climatically appropriate and in fact are decimating the local ecosystem. Invasive species such as mustard and cheatgrass, which were brought in by the European settlers and the farmers, and have now completely outcompeted the natives. Um, the the mustard that's there in, in um, Los Angeles actually suppresses the native mycorrhizal fungi that's in the soil. So at Elysian Park, at the Elysian Park test plot, push, we've been trying to push out the um, the mustard as much as possible and trying to restore that native mycorrhizal fungi. Um, in the soil. Um, so this all started because our office was near this park. And a lot of us live in, live in the area too, and we would take walks in the park, and then we'd come back to the office and have these conversations like, man, Leisure Park, it's kind of sad. Um, down in the valley of the park, they irrigate, there's lawns, um, there's birthday parties and quinceaneras and bounce houses, and it's a very vibrant public space. There's big, beautiful old trees, and it's well taken care of. But up on the kind of dusty hilltops, the ecosystems have been forgotten, the irrigation's broken, the invasives are a problem. Um, so we decided we wanted to get involved and start being more active and do some advocacy, right? Use some of our design skills for advocacy. Um, so we started conversations with the community, neighbors. Um, there's an existing citizens committee to save Alicia Park that's been around for 50 years. Um, Rec the Rec and Parks, which is the local city agency, we started attending as many meetings we could, and we very quickly discovered that the city is overwhelmed with lots of other urban problems, and they're not very concerned about the shrub layer. 
um, in the park. Um, they are very concerned about the tree canopy. They're very focused on uh, planting as many trees as possible to mitigate against the urban heat island effect um, and to provide shade, which is an equity issue in Los Angeles. I don't know if any of you saw the National Geographic article from, I think, last year, the year before, about um, about the inequality of shade in Los Angeles and how it is a, a climate justice issue in a city that gets the, as hot as LA does. Um, so rightly so, Rec and Parks is focused on the tree canopy. Unfortunately, they're not planting native species because they're very worried, worried about disease and they're worried that the native species aren't gonna make it. And so they're bringing in species from all over the world that they think are gonna be more resilient. So in response to that, we um, put forth the idea of test plot which was to bring some um, complex ecology back to the shrub layer and the ground plane of the park, which was totally missing. Um, we were also inspired, on the left-hand side, you see some of the invasives of the park, and then you also see the um, half-dead eucalyptus. The LA Times did a piece on this several years ago and called Elysian Park a zombie forest, basically like a big fire hazard, a big fire waiting to happen. So lots of problems in that, in that um, park. But there was one little glimmer of hope, which the photo on the right is from Marion Harlow Memorial Grove. She was one of the original founders of the Citizens Committee to Save Elysian Park in the 60s. And this grove has been lovingly tended by the community for decades. And the reason it's here is there is a lone hose bib at the middle of the grove that is a public hose bib. Nobody regulates it, nobody turns it off, it's on, it's there for whoever wants to use it. Um, dog walkers use it. Um, our big homeless population uses it, people use it to survive. Um, and people use it to water the plants in the grove. So this diagram on the left was the first concept diagram, which basically was to keep it as simple as possible. And we're gonna place our plots as far as the hose will go. So we literally went out there and connected a hose to the hose bin and we brought a sprinkler and we laid out the plots on site. So this diagram was actually done after we we did our layout. And um, the concept of the test plot was what are the minimal inputs it would take to reestablish um, some native plants in Elysian Park? And so um, the idea was to keep it as simple as possible. So the, the, the shape of the plot was determined by the throw of the sprinkler. So the idea is that any volunteer could go out there and grab the hose from under the bench and attach the sprinkler that we hide in the neighbor's shed on the other side and put it out there and turn it on and they could watch the birds and help to do some ecological restoration, that it was kind of like full, full proof. Um, and let's see, do I wanna talk about bureaucracy? Yeah, I will. So um, a, big, a big factor in test plot was navigating the bureaucracy. We had to get real agile and kind of pierce the bureaucracy. Um, to do a garden in a public park normally takes years. You have to go through commi you know, committees, community meetings, you need complex drawings. And I think one thing that Terramoto is good at is kind of shaking things up and being agile and um, respectfully inflammatory. And we basically said to them, well, how can we do this faster? What can we do? And they said, well, if you call it a temporary garden, if the garden is temporary, and if you are stewarding, and if you're doing maintenance, and you're doing volunteer work, and you're just caring for the land, then by all means, go ahead. So that was how we got approved. We basically figured out how to go around the bureaucracy. Um, and that's not to say that we don't want the public involved in the process, but it is it was a way to do this quickly. Um, and so at Elysian, we had to flush out the existing seed bank. We watered, we weeded, we watered, we weeded. And that was per the advice of some ecologists that we were consulting with. We made sure to consult with as many people as possible. Um, ecologists, educators, um, community members who had been tending this land for a long time. Um, plant growers, um, landscape, other landscape architects that we know. Um, and this method, I think, worked quite well. Um, and we um, would have meeting parties and volunteer days, and lots of people would come out because this actually happened right at the start of the pandemic. And so it was perfect timing because people were clamoring to be outside and missing the sense of community. And uh, our volunteer days actually, we started calling them plant church because people would tell us that it was their church, that this was where they found um, their meaning during a, an otherwise very dark time. We had some successes and we had some failures. One of our plots did really well. The other plot um, was 
very promptly eaten by gophers. Um, so in the next round, we did gopher cages. Um, and things have been better now, but the plot on the right is a little slow to start because we had a mishap at the beginning. Um, but those failures are great. That's part of the process, and that's part of our learning, and we're not afraid of those. And so I'm going to share our guiding principles for test plot. Um, to cultivate beauty and biodiversity, we want to be low tech and low budget. Like I said, kind of what are, what are the minimal inputs that it takes to get some native plants established in a park that needs them. Hands in the soil, maintenance is not a dirty word. I know that um, some of you practitioners and um, professionals have probably heard from clients, no low maintenance, no maintenance, right? That's what we hear from clients all the time. And test plot, the work at Terramoto and also through test plot, we, we want to change that. We want maintenance to be the thing that everybody wants to do um, because it's, it's beautiful. Um, we want to honor and work with the seasons. As I said, experimentation is good. We have permission to fail. Uh, we want to plant and care for climate change. Um, we're open source, meaning we share all of our information. In fact, if you go to our test plot website, you can download a PDF on how to make your own test plot. Um, and then with partnerships with academia, we now have a stronger monitoring and evaluation program as well that we share. Um, expansion and replication in mind. We used to have the word scalability up there, scalability in mind, and I nixed that word because I don't like it. I don't like the idea of scaling, right? Everyone talks about scale. Can this idea scale? Can it scale? And I think what's great about test plot and the reason it resonates with so many people is it's tiny and it's hyper local and it's not scaled up. And the sense of community here is really strong. And so rather than the idea of scaling up to some kind of monstrous organization, um, that's controlled at the top. I think the idea is for test plot to replicate. Um, if anyone has a better word, let me know. Um, we seek a coalition of community groups. Um, so we now have several test plots and they are all different and we work with different community groups at every plot. There's no one model for stewardship. Stewardship looks different in every different community and that's really important. Um, we try to be really agile in how we work with the different communities and not being prescriptive and asking them what they want. Um, and we do have communities coming to us saying we want a test plot now. So this was the first one in, in Elysian Park, but we now have about seven test plots across California. And the last principle is to work somewhere between native gardening and ecological restoration. The native gardening um, world in California is um, very uh, strict and fervent and lots of people with a lot of passion. And we are those people, we're native plant people. Um, but when you talk to restoration ecologists, they have a very different mindset, right? They don't know, we're not gardening. What we're doing is not gardening. Um, but back to Peter Del Trinici, the, um, the man who has the term novel ecosystems, he actually thinks that gardening, that ecological restoration needs to bring gardening back into their fold as well. We need to stop being afraid of the word gardening because the um, native gardening and ecological restoration have a lot to learn from each other. So we like to work somewhere in between those two. Um, as I said, we've replicated. So our first plot was Elysian Park. It was successful. The plants were thriving. The community was happy. A colleague of mine who teaches at the University of Southern California, USC, um, named Jen Toy, came to me and said, what's with this test plot thing I'm seeing on your website? Can you take me? And so I took her and showed her the Elysian plots, the circles, and she said, we got to do this. we got to bring this into the landscape architecture education, um, education. She was very excited about the idea of bringing hands-on tactile learning into the landscape architecture training. Um, when she did, so the second test plot was actually a studio that Jen Toy ran and I sort of helped out with, and this is at another park in Los Angeles, and she was shocked that um, for most of the students in this studio, this was the first time that they had ever planted a plant. Um, so that, her mission now with test plot is to bring it into the design education and to bring more of that hands-on experience to people. Um, Jen has also been really instrumental in expanding our experimentation into sort of more formal experiments, right? Like the first test of test plot was, can this work? Can we do it? Um, what are the minimal inputs? And now Jen is testing, you know, mulch, no mulch, mycorrhizal fungi, um, amendments, no amendments, compost, no compost, and documenting um, the growth and change of the plots over time. 
So it's all really only through the collaboration with academia that this has been that this idea has been able to thrive. Um, this is the third and the fourth test plot. Uh, Baldwin Hills overlook a completely different part of Los Angeles, completely different community, different ecological problems, different invasive plants. Um, we collaborated with the Nature Nexus Institute there. Um, on the right hand side is Debs Park, again, totally different setting, collaborated with the Audubon Society. So what's happening now is these organizations, environmental organizations in, um, in Los Angeles are coming to us. And they're saying, you can get volunteers to come out for your test plots. Um, you get people excited about stewardship, could you please partner with us to get, we want a test plot here. We want to reinvigorate our volunteer program. It's often for communities that kind of need that. Their volunteer program is, has lagged, and now they need a reinvigoration. And those are kind of the, the partners that we're working with. Um, and here's one on USC campus. This is the one um, private test plot that we have. But this was really big because the campus of USC was full of kind of colonizer plants, right? Like faux European landscape plantings that are not appropriate to Southern California. And it's been that way for decades. And now that's finally starting to change. There's a test plot happening on campus. Um, the crew, the landscaping crew at USC has just now been trained by the Theodore Payne Foundation, which is the big native plant foundation in town. So things are starting to change on campus and we're very grateful to be a part of it. And then the one on the right is our first test plot up in Northern California. Um, and Jen is now, Jen Toy, the part, my partner in Test Plot, is now um, establishing Test Plot as an official nonprofit. And if anyone wants to do a Test Plot here in Calgary, let us know. Francisco was talking about Nose Hill, or if there's any other parks that could benefit from community stewardship. We, we want this idea to move around and spread. Um, so let us know. Um, test Plot, I just want to also say, is a protest against, it's, it's a bit of a protest against high gloss, high budget park design. It's an expression of care, um, and I think the approach could do a lot for public spaces. Do we really need to spend $65 million on a new park on the waterfront, or does the existing park maybe just need some stewardship? I don't know. Maybe we do need a new park, but maybe stewardship would be a better use of money. Just throwing that out there. Um, and test plot's also a celebration of so now I'm going to talk about land and labor. Can I keep going, Megan? It's 50 minutes. OK. Yeah. Um, so Terramoto is a champion of the people who install and maintain our gardens. We always have them. We've always loved um, working with them and highlighting their work on our website. We've always documented the beauty and poetry in the process of, of land work and land care. Um, but we're also fascinated by the complexities of labor and its intersection with the land. We love the book Paradise Transplanted by Pierrette Anonio Sotelo. Um, again, the book's called Paradise Transplanted. It's very specific to talking about California landscapes and the making of California landscapes and how um, the ways that immigration is played into the making of gardens and landscapes in California, um, issues of economy, culture, class, and power, and how all of those issues affect the landscapes of Southern California. Um, she writes, it's tempting to see gardens as little havens ripped off from the public world, but they are not separate from society. Gardens and landscapes are embedded in complex social hierarchies and contestations over power and resources. In the summer of 2020, uh, uh, which was a tense and eye-opening summer um, in the United States surrounding race and power, our office galvanized um, the kind of loose conversations that we had been having about labor in our office um, into something more formal. We, um, we put out this public call for action with Metropolis, call, uh, this article called Landscape Architecture Has a Labor Acknowledgement Problem, where we basically called out the erasure of labor from the gardening and landscaping profession, right? The awards, the finished images that you see in magazines completely erases the process that goes into making and shaping those landscapes. And we find that highly problematic um, because it devalues the labor and the work that goes into making these gardens. And designers tend to get all the accolades and the press, um, but none of these landscapes would, would be here if it weren't um, for, the pe for the people working on them, um, for the gardeners and, and the, the contractors. Um, so we wrote how we seek to elevate the status of people who work on the land and who bring our designs to life. It's that erasure of labor from finished photos in the media, um, and this does a disservice to our industry 
uh, because honestly, we should seek to place the highest value on land work and land care. Um, but the erasure of labor only serves to devalue this work. When we devalue the labor, we devalue the land itself. So one big issue that we see in, in California is, is a very strong culture of private property and, and um, keeping people's gardens tidy. So lawns are still, unfortunately, quite popular in Los Angeles, even though they're very climatically inappropriate. And people spend a lot of money to hire gardeners to come tend their lawns. And the culture in Los Angeles is definitely mow, blow, and go. I'm sure you guys see a little bit of that here in the maintenance of public landscapes and private landscapes. Um, but it, that culture is really strong in LA. And because most of the workers in Los Angeles are um, usually newer immigrants from Mexico and other countries in Central America, um, they are kind of the most precarious economic populations in the city, right? And um, they fall into gardening. Um, and the problem is that land care work is so devalued that in order to make a living as a gardener in Southern California, you have to often go to 15 gardens in a day in order to make the money work, in order to really make enough money. And what that means is that they are blitzing from one garden to the next just to tidy and make it look like they were there so that they can get paid. And it's not their fault, they're just trying to make a living. But because we devalue the labor and because they get paid so little, um, we are actually doing really bad harm to the landscape. The, the culture of blowers is so bad for the soil. We're just destroying, it's, we are not doing anything to tend the land when our culture of gardening works this way. And we actually saw it in a lot of projects. So this was another impetus to us starting this whole land and labor effort was we would install gardens and they would very quickly um, deteriorate due to like really poor care because, um, and it's simply because the gardeners aren't getting paid enough. So one, one key thing that we do is we just try to convince our clients to pay, pay our gardeners more. And we try to talk about it in venues like this. So we formalized our group um, and we sort of formed this series of ongoing commitments. Number one, seeking out and learning from a coalition of advocates. We do not pretend to know all the answers. It's so complex. It's mired in you know, years, decades, centuries of power and politics and economy. But we are trying to learn as much as we can um, from immigration rights advocates, um, from the gardeners themselves, people who are doing progressive things like sort of B corporations for their landscaping businesses. So we're trying to talk as, to as many people as possible. And this is something we're still actively doing now. Like our land and labor group met last week. We are still trying to figure out how to be better. And it will probably be going on for years and years. Uh, number two, we want to learn more about fair compensation, benefits, and unions, and developing standards for ourselves and for those we work with. Number three, communicating on this topic and highlighting the skill and talent of the crews we work with. As I said earlier, our construction drawings are not sacred. There is so much knowledge that the guys on site have that they bring to the table that we value so much. So the more we can talk about that, um, we think the better for kind of lifting up the value of labor on site. And number four is client education, and this is a big one because we would see a lot of clients make un very unfair demands on, on their gardeners. Oh, can't you just trim that hedge over there while you're here doing this other thing, which essentially amounts to wage theft because there's power dynamics at play. There's racial and class power dynamics at play, and the gardeners often feel like they can't say no to the clients because they don't want to lose the job down the line. And so those subtle power dynamics play into actual wages lost for people. So when we now on site, we see these little micro instances, we try to step in and say, no, no, uh, we're not gonna do that. You need to pay the gardener appropriately for what you're asking them to do. Um, number five, elevating land stewardship and maintenance in general, just by giving it more visibility. And number six, advocating on this topic locally, statewide, nationally. That's something we're also still kind of figuring out is how to be good advocates um, on the public stage. We're sort of new with that and we're asking for help. And luckily people are excited to help. Labor is a very big topic. Is it a big topic in, in, in Canada right now? It's very big in the United States, the topic of unions and labor in general. Have you guys been paying attention to the labor issues in, within the architecture offices? Um, I won't name 
names, but um, there, you know, some prominent firms have been called out for overworking junior staffers and just this culture of overwork, you know, 70 hour work weeks being the norm, and how that amounts to exploitation. We see a very strong connection between kind of the white collar exploitation of our landscape architecture industry, of the architecture and landscape architecture industries, and the blue collar exploitation, which also is kind of a false dichotomy. The fact that we see ourselves as separate, the white collar and blue collar, we are not separate. We are all together and we should all be supporting each other in labor justice. Um, I want to quote Michelle Franco, who's an academic from the University of Ohio. And she writes, um, she, she's somebody we've been talking with a lot about this topic. She's very interested in it and has a lot of brilliant things to say. And she says, for designers concerned with social and spatial justice, it is necessary to expand the context of landscape work beyond the site's physical and historic narratives to include the context and the conditions of the people laboring at the site itself. So she's been very supportive to us in this endeavor, helping us think about credit and representation, collaboration on site, compensation, challenging notions of class and skill, this idea of unskilled labor, right? Hiring people to do demolition, oh, that's just unskilled labor. We gotta stop talking about the, the the work that way. Um, it just perpetuates these class divides. Um, the way that immigration plays into these topics, capitalism, slavery is not up there, but I think that's one. The, the legacy of slavery in the United States is, plays into this, this topic for sure. Exploitation, safety and risk, and then just the general revaluing of labor and land care. I'm going to start wrapping it up, but before I do, I want to leave you guys with a couple of um, people that we find really inspiring. So yes, yes, Terramoto this, Terramoto that, but we want to share um, some other practitioners and writers' work that we find um, really lovely. And the first is Julie Bartman of Dirt Studio. Dirt stands for dump it right there. And she's very much an advocate of using, reusing things on site, even on complex post-industrial sites, finding ways to clean them up and reuse them right there rather than um, spending fossil fuels to transport chunks of concrete across town to the dump. Um, so we find her work really inspiring. She also did a recent lecture, I think at Harvard, on modesty and how we need more modesty in our profession of landscape architecture rather than kind of bold, brazen designs that you've never seen before, going back to gardening, going back to a more modest approach. So if you don't know her work, I highly recommend you check it out. She's, she's brilliant. Um, we also looked to a couple books for um, understanding stewardship in California. If you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, do. Um, Robin Walkimer is a beautiful writer who writes on kind of the intersection between indigenous wisdom and scientific knowledge and her personal journey in bringing those two things together. Um, and then Tending the Wild, which is a mind-blowing book about the landscapes of California and how um, when European settlers first arrived and they found these beautiful landscapes that they wanted to protect and turn into, and turn into national parks, um, these landscapes were not wild. They were being tended by the indigenous people that lived there. And that's why they were so beautiful and biodiverse. You know, they were using fire to manage um, their hunting regimes. And they were harvesting and actually, and uh, Robin Wall Kemmerer talks about how the act of harvesting can actually enhance ecosystem health. Um, so those books have been really powerful for us in our um, understanding of stewardship in California. Um, this one's for, for Francisco again, who's not here, but um, if you guys don't know Benjamin Vogt, he's got a little practice called Monarch Gardens and he's practicing out of Nebraska. And it's basically all about naturalizing, but what's cool is that his front yard is in the context of a very typical suburban development, and he's the only person in this development that has done this, and so the photos are pretty striking to have this like classic American lawn up against this wild native prairie that's, that's a beautiful example of ecological restoration. Um, another boat, different, Gunther Boat, who's a Swiss practitioner, if you don't know him, I don't know, we like boats, I don't know why, um, if you don't know his work, check it out. Uh, just really beautiful, kind of dreamy landscapes that evoke um, both the kind of familiar and the otherworldly, a lot of use of natural materials, um, interesting compositions and juxtapositions. And the last piece of inspiration I'll mention is Repairscapes, which is an Instagram account uh, that I want you all to check out, um, maybe especially the urban planners in the room. Um, the, the account is dedicated to documenting projects that um, are about repair. 
rather than total erasure and total newness. Um, so Shannon Matter, who's a, a thinker on the topic of care and has some interesting articles about that topic, says what we really need to study is how the world gets put back together. The everyday work of maintenance, caretaking, and repair. So this account is, I think, run by landscape architects, but it's um, much more of a, a maintenance approach. And they do a really interesting job at catalog cataloging projects of like urban improvement that have this more um, caretaking and repair mindset. Um, the project on the lower left, I think what's interesting about that is that it would have been too expensive to bust up all of the asphalt and take it out. So they did it in strategic sections and you still have a lovely ecology that pops up and actually the forms are kind of interesting. Um, so my last comments, I'm gonna try to bring the title of the talk, kind of weaving everything together back to the title of the talk. So our civilization is definitely at a crossroads. We all know this, climate change, political tensions, ecosystem collapse, extreme economic disparity, all threaten to drastically change the way we live. Terramoto likes to work with this full awareness in mind, not in a depressing way, but in a positive outlook way. Um, we like to think that we uh, are designing gardens not for this broken civilization, but for the next one, one that's hopefully more wholly rooted in local systems of knowledge, um, local systems and local knowledge, rooted in working with our ecosystems, living within our means, and tending to our land. With that, we believe design should be less about technological fixes and complicated forms and public spectacle, and more about efficient advocacy for stewardship and of our shared landscapes. The world is a garden, let's tend to it. Thank you. I thanks so much for your your talk. Yeah, thanks for um, having me. I really liked when you talked about using like reusing materials on site and being mindful of the amount of construction waste. Yeah. I was just wondering, in Los Angeles, is there any construction waste kind of programs? Um, like for for in, in kind of recycling within the city? Yeah, exactly. Um, no, not that I know formally. We did just learn about some kind of rogue website that's like a Craigslist for construction where you can say, hey, I need fill, and hey, I have a bunch of dirt I have to haul away. So kind of coordinating things like that. Um, I haven't seen it yet. This is like gossip in the office. But not, I don't know of any formal system. Does Calgary have anything? It doesn't, no. I'm just wondering if other cities do. I feel like, okay, I know I poo-pooed technology and like technological fixes, but I do feel like that is, a spot where technology would come in super handy. Like somebody make an app, right? Where all the construction sites could coordinate and share in their waste materials. Totally, um, or even just some policy changes maybe. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. talked about uh, like natural play and natural playgrounds, especially because I kind of like grew up uh, going into the mountains with my sister and kind of building fairy houses and stuff and forests. Um, and I know that like natural play is kind of, uh, there's kind of like a movement for that in I think like Denmark and certain places in Europe. Have you ever like worked on anything that's like specifically like a natural playground? Or have, is it something that you you say you constantly integrate that right. into your work? We um, we do when like we have a lot of clients who have kids, right? And so oftentimes we will suggest things like mud pits. That's my new thing. It's like your family needs a mud pit. Um, <laughs> like I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like I don't have any pressing images. 
I just came up with this. I'm sorry. Um, just trust me. Let me make it. Um, uh, so we do it on private gardens. We have worked on some preschools. So some of the photos I showed, there was like the cobble mound with the slide. I mean, let's be honest, that was not cheap. That was done by a private ent entity up in the Bay Area, a tech company that has a preschool attached to their campus. So, um, and that garden was kind of a natural garden. Those photos, the plants were not very well drawn in. Um, but we have done, we did that preschool, we did another preschool in California that um, was the founder of the preschool really wanted it to be a wild garden. The photo of the kids with the farm pump and the arroyo, she wanted to replicate like an arroyo from the mountains down on her little site in Santa Monica. So we, we did basically a little micro forest and um, did the whole arroyo thing. Um, natural, I don't know that we've done any playgrounds that are like, we definitely haven't done any public playgrounds that are natural playgrounds. And I think that's, that's where we would like to go. So far it's been preschools and but all in the public works that we've done, like I said, we, you know, just boulders and logs and things, those become play elements. So yeah, they're seating elements, but they're also play elements. Perfect, thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm really interested in that idea of, of informality that you talked about. And I'm curious as to whether with internal motor, there's this kind of inclination, or um, whether it's you know through your own intention or through some sort of imposition to become less informal and more formalized and more kind of maybe bureaucratic about the way that you take work on, mm -hmm. and and how you maybe kind of hold on to that sense of informality uh, in, in the studio. You are spot on because this is an internal conflict that we have in our office. We've, we've been successful. Um, our office has grown. I was the fourth employee, and now we have you know, 20, 24, 25. And um, we're kind of at that breaking point where we're not a small firm anymore. And I have to keep reminding the founders of this. <laughs> um, because we do need systems of management and formality and policy, right? We can't be as informal as we used to be because we're responsible for the livelihoods of all 25 of our employees. So um, there is a kind of internal tension between informal and formal, um, kind of anarchic and bureaucratic, um, that hopefully, I think like the next five years of Terramoto will be about navigating that. We do have a really strong inclination for more public work. That is definitely something we're seeking, um, but it's a little problematic because our office is not very big and most public projects involve insane drawing sets, insane, hours of coordination, intern labor, cheap intern labor to produce massive drawing sets. Um, and our office is not equipped for those. So the types of public projects that we work on tend to be um, ones that are done very creatively, like whether it's one of these benevolent developers or um, the platform park that I showed you is actually at a mall in Los Angeles, an outdoor mall. So it's like a private entity who owns the mall also wanted to make a public garden, and so it's privately owned. But So we were able to skirt some of the normal development procedures with that. Um, so it's about finding the right kind of creative partners to do public work. But that is going to be a huge question for us over the years, is how do we like grow our company and keep expanding, um, replicating, um, without getting bogged down? <laughs> yeah, to grow or not to grow, that's the question. It's a great, it's a great question. I'm, I'm a partner at, uh, at a design build firm in Calgary, just across the river. And I think that that is something that, you know, that what initially attracted you to the work and to being engaged in that sense of playfulness, um, just holding on to that for dear life yeah. in the face of, you know, also being ambitious and wanting to take on bigger things. And, right. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Uh, oh. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm wondering is, if you comment on is certainly through your eyes and the eyes of your colleagues, when you see a natural or a wild land. So, how can you, have you had sort of experiences of needing to bridge that gap with people? And like, how do you do that? Yeah, for sure. We've planned.
sometimes they've made a plan on projects and the clients come back and they say, this plan looks dead and we have to explain the concept of dormancy. Um, so we try to do client education as much as possible, but sometimes it's just not worth the headache for us, right? We have to like pick our battles. Um, so we just, we, yeah, we try to pick our battles. We try to educate clients that we feel like are open to maybe sh that kind of shift in mentality about what a garden looks like or what a native landscape looks like. Because yeah, for sure in summer, California gardens go super brown and go very dormant. Um, and our summer is like your winter where um, things can look kind of dead, but if you know where to look or how, how to look, you can see the beauty in that. Um, and so yeah, we try, to, we try to train our clients. Other times there's some clients that we just say, oh, it's a lost cause, let's just, <laughs> back and let's replace this native grass with something that's a little more bulletproof and is not invasive and you know um, and then we won't work with this person again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. When I was looking at the style of a lot of your gardens, there's a uh, gravel often, you know, from you know, your hardscape, your gravel, and it just bleeds into the plant, and this plant is coming down into the gravel. Oh yeah, no edges. Is that, uh, like here you've got your hard space, you have your lawn, and then you have your perennial garden, but there's you know, very defined you know, uh, borders between all those three elements, but uh, would you say that, is that like a California thing, or is that something you do a lot with your firm, just that? It's a terremoto thing. Yeah. Yeah, no edges. We try, like a lot of times the architects we work with are the homeowners, they want, you know, they want that middle edge, you know, I, why? I don't, well, magazine, I don't know why they want the metal edge, but they, everybody wants the metal edge, and we have to fight. We just say, just like, the, the, I don't need the edge, the carpet. Just, you, your gardener will, every once in a while, will just shovel some of the gravel back. And, um, yeah, I think it's a, I mean, listen, I presented Terramoto's work, and I probably should have done a better job of highlighting other practitioners in Los Angeles that are doing pretty groovy also there are a lot of small firms um, you know single person operations teams of three teams of two smaller garden designers who are doing really progressive things that are pushing boundaries that we're not they're doing hugel culture they're you know they've been doing no edges forever they're doing like truly radical garden design and we look to them as well so we're not the only ones doing it but i would say that we're the only ones maybe like in architectural digest doing it um, which I think is good. We have mixed feelings about being in architectural digest, um, but hopefully, I think on the balance, it's a good thing because we can um, show people that no edging is okay. Uh, you know. That's yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of generally curious about your client-facing process and relationships, especially as you know, a component of architecture. I feel like people's expectations are constantly moving towards more defined, more formalized, more like digitally rendered, presented in exactly the way things are going to be executed kind of style. And I'm curious with, obviously, with landscape, that's you know less less inclined towards those those methodologies of design and drawing as you showed, but kind of how you convince people and what those discussions and those processes with clients look like as a way to, you know, convince them and to also kind of envision something together uh, in a holistic and very, uh, I guess, improvisational way in some, mm -hmm. in some senses. I actually think what you're talking about is prevalent in landscape architecture. I mean, I used to work in big, big traditional offices and that kind of like obsession with the rendering and with things being precise and oh is you know the garden better I want to see exactly how the garden is going to look which is really messed up and quite rude it's like it, let the garden be the garden why do you need to see there's a there's a book called the garden as an art by Mara Miller I think it's a very like academic philosophical book but it is very interesting and she writes about how Guard, the, the garden is an art form in itself, and it's an art form that is not recognized by the art world, right? It's see, gardening is seen as a separate thing. Gardening is not part of the art world, but she thinks the art world is really missing out on one of the finest arts that we have on the planet. 
Um, it's a really cool book. So my whole thing is always like, let the garden be the art. Why do you need to see the garden before the garden exists? Just isn't it going to be so much more special and magical to experience how that garden evolved over time? So if we have a groovy client, I can say something like that to them. But those are few and far between. Um, typically, we um, try to meet the client where they're at. So we do have some clients who absolutely need records. And like I said, we have people on staff that do that. Um, and then, but a lot of times we have clients who, thankfully, we have a, a big body of work. Um, we've been able to, to do a lot of projects in the last, you know, eight, nine years with Karamoto. And so most of the, a lot of the people that are coming to us for work, they've seen our website and they trust us. And they know that it's going to be, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be, you're going to enjoy it. It's going to be great. You don't need to see the rendering. Um, so it's sort of, you know, back to the, like, making our battles thing. Now, if it's a if it's a project where it's a big money maker and it's a big important project for our office, we will do the renderings. We will bite our tongue in and, and do them. Um, but more and more, our office is kind of per your question of like to grow or not to grow and how do you manage that. We've as an office had open discussions about trying to limit the kind of natural impulse for bigger projects and um, you know growing the office, which just happens with firms that are successful. And we're explicitly trying to um, actually like stay local to the neighborhoods that we were started in and to take on projects of lower budgets. Um, there was a, a drawing I showed you. Let's see if I can find this. There was a, a page that showed a little hand drawing. Um, and I want to show this to you because this is a project that I did recently, super low budget. Um, and this was a, a local client. They wanted a a garden with no irrigation, which is another thing we're trying to push on our, on our clients. Just drop the irrigation. Like, you don't need it. You should get out there. You should establish your plants. Um, you will have a much more meaningful relationship to your garden if it's you watering your plants. And then you won't be putting plastic in the soil. Um, so this was a very cheap project. And that was all I did, this, this one pager, where I did a hand drawing. I did the plant counts on the page. I wrote out all the notes. It's with a contractor I work with. So this was a project. There was no rendering. There was none of that. The client trusted us, and we were able to do it very affordably for this, you know, upper middle class family that barely had money to do a landscape for their, their baby. Um, so it's a balance. You know, we do we do both, and it depends. Like I said, it depends on the client. But I think per the like trying not to grow, we are trying to move more towards the just trust us. Let's not spend your money, you don't, why do you want to spend your money on us spending hours and hours and hours doing renderings? Do you want to spend your money on us making you a garden? <laughs> it's, it's always bought as well with my mind, but people love renderings. <laughs> I, I think I, uh, there was one more. Can we do one more? We'll make, we'll make it quick. Architecture student, but I also strongly identify as a gardener. And um, I guess I think a lot of the time I do keep those things a little bit separate in my life. And I think that a lot of the time the difference very much is intimacy. And I'm going to say the naughty word: <laughs> um, Is there a place for larger scale for gardening and larger scale projects? Because I think regional landscape design is really interesting, and I think it certainly has its value. And I'd love to see are there ways that we can incorporate the intimacy of gardening on, on larger scales, and do you think that's possible? Is there a place for gardening in that? I hope so. And that's actually like a big question we ask ourselves, is how can we um, have more integrated, a more integrated workflow with the laborers, right? To um, have more of a fruitful result on public projects, so it's not this typical bureaucratic 12 steps removed, the landscape architect is 12 steps removed from the contractor, it's all the conversations are happening through RFIs, There's, you don't have any of that magic, right? There's like all these layers of paperwork. Um, Michelle Franco, who from OSU, thinks um, that it's also a labor issue, that that system just alienates everybody and leads to further devaluation of, of the labor, and that the more that the designers are directly collaborating with the laborers. So I, but the problem is the, is the, con the way that contracts are structured. 
Um, that's that's a big, it's liability and contracts. And so that's a thing that I don't know, she and I have talked about, I don't know how you're ever gonna get around that. I do wonder if this, I have wondered in the past if the solution is just smaller scale public projects. So maybe there's like, maybe it's a regional plan, but maybe instead of big bulldozers coming in and doing the whole thing, it's kind of happens in smaller chunks with more of like a stewardship and care mindset. Um, but I love that question and I hope that there is a way to do it. So I don't know, keep in touch, let me know how you figure it out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.